Hey guys, guess what we're talking about today? Do you like my Star Wars cup? It's even got a R2-D2 uh, head lid. Pretty cool. With a galaxy as vast as the one in the Star Wars universe, there's many stories to tell that can fall into almost any genre of fiction. And over the several decades since the release of Episode Four, Star Wars has had an incredible cultural impact and has entertained all manner of people ever since. But among the more familiar tales told in the mainstream movies and TV shows, there are some things in the Star Wars universe that range from unsettling and weird to downright creepy and horrifying. Now sure, there's the brain worms of Geonosis and the Night Sister zombies, but that's light work for chumps, and there are some way crazier things that the Star Wars universe has to offer. If you thought that Star Wars had no place for things like body horror, Lovecraftian entities, and other types of creepy cosmic threats, then you'd be wrong. And today, we're gonna talk about some of them. Now I should point out that most of what I'm going to cover is from before the Disney takeover, and it's therefore considered part of the Legends canon, but that doesn't make them any less interesting or worth talking about, in my opinion. And if anything clashes with the current continuity of the films, or there's a different version of a character or storyline, or an entirely new character or storyline altogether, then that's why. The Star Wars lore pre-Disney had a lot of great stories and concepts, but I think we can also agree that sometimes it got a little out of hand. Now many of the things I'm going to mention are involved in multiple story arcs spread out over decades, both within the Star Wars timeline and in real life, so understand that I won't be able to fully tell the story of each thing. If one of these is interesting to you and you want to know more, then I'd heavily encourage you to track down the book, comic, or game that it comes from, or at the very least, read the entire article on Wikipedia. I also made this video with very few visual aids, so it's mostly going to just be me talking. I will show a few pictures and clips here and there, but I didn't want to draw out the editing process too much for this video, so feel free to just listen along. Without wasting any more time, we're going to get right into it with what I think is one of the biggest threats we've ever seen to the Star Wars universe, Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> In all seriousness, I'm going to start out strong with one of my personal favorites, the elusive predatory alien race called the Anzati. The Anzati were a near-humanoid species with a unique relationship to the Force and a few peculiar biological qualities. One was that they didn't actually generate any body heat because they didn't have any sort of pulse or blood flow, meaning that their circulatory system was almost entirely a mystery to other races. It was also rather hard to study the biology of the Anzadi, partially because they were an elusive nomadic race. The Anzadi were incredibly long-lived, meaning that an Anzot who was several hundred years old was considered juvenile, and they had already been roaming the galaxy long before the first iterations of the Galactic Republic. Now, how were the Anzadi able to live for literal eons? Well, they got their sustenance by feeding on the force essence of other beings using two proboscis on their face that they used to suck out the brains of their victims. So basically, space vampires. The more that the Anzadi fed on what they called the soup, the more uncontrollable their cravings became. They could really feed on anyone since the Force exists within all creatures, but they naturally preferred the soup of Jedi, Sith, and other Force sensitives due to their attunement and stronger connection to the Force. This meant that their prey were often formidable warriors and put up a decent fight, so the Anzadi trained themselves to be both physically and mentally superior. Many Anzadi rivaled a human at the peak of physical fitness with the intellect and mental fortitude to match. Now their twin proboscises or proboscis or face tentacles that they used to consume the brain soup could also be retracted back into their cheek cavities, meaning that they could easily pass as just another near-human species if they needed to. Many Anzadi would disguise themselves in this manner to infiltrate communities in search of a victim, and once a victim was chosen, an Anzot could lure them away with psychic manipulation, not too unlike the Jedi mind trick. They would then seize and restrain their victim, extend their proboscises, and force them up the nostrils or equivalent face openings, reaching into the victim's brain and sucking out their soup. Like I said, Anzadi lived for a very long time, and while longevity naturally exposed them to all sorts of scholarly subjects, they rarely concerned themselves with philosophy or science or higher knowledge if it didn't help them become better hunters. The most important skills and knowledge to the Anzadi were those of espionage, stealth, and deception. This naturally made them excellent assassins and bounty hunters, and Anzadi were often employed to kill Jedi or other Force-sensitive beings. 
There was, however, one Anzot named Volf Karko who actually joined the Jedi Order and for a time resisted the urge to feed. But eventually the curiosity got too much for him to ignore and he indulged, quickly becoming addicted and being driven into a bloodlust and madness that caused him to eventually fall to the dark side, forcing the Jedi Council to go hunt him down. Once he was subdued, they placed him in a stasis pod on the prison planet of Kifex, keeping his body in a comatose state but leaving his mind fully conscious so that he could ponder his sins. Instead, he spent the centuries wallowing in anger and plotting his revenge on the Jedi if or when he ever escaped. He was able to use his psychic powers to draw other Anzadi to Kifex, turning the prison into a sort of temple where he was regarded as the Dark Dreamer. He spent years leeching off the essence of his followers, sustaining himself for nearly a thousand years while they all regressed into mindless feral beasts. About 30 years before the Battle of Yavin, Aayla Secura arrived on Kifex, and after sensing her presence, Wolf Karko lured her in and tricked her into setting him free. He then corrupted her mind and made her his apprentice with the ultimate goal of turning her into the queen of his dark regime. Karko's sudden resurgence obviously drew the attention of the Jedi, and several knights, including Quinlan Voss, who was Isla's former master, were sent to investigate. After infiltrating Karko's stronghold and seeing his corrupted former Padawan, Quinlan faced Karko in a lightsaber duel that ended with him slicing Karko in half, putting a stop to his threat and rescuing Sakura from his grasp. So, psychic space vampires that feed on a person's life essence and can become addicted to brain soup like a crack fiend is super weird, Super interesting, and there is so much potential there for some really creepy stories to be told, and I love it. Next up is the Nom Nol, which is essentially a sentient mass of evil slime. Nom Nol is an incomprehensibly ancient entity, with some speculating that it existed since before even the Celestials that created the galaxy, and some believed it may have even originated from an alternate dimension or parallel universe. It's even been speculated that the cosmic rift separating the populated section of the galaxy from the unknown regions was created by the Celestials to hold back the Nom Nol. Nom Nol's entire form was made up of nothing more than a slimy gray ooze that had a distinctly sweet yet rotten smell. It could split its mass up and manifest in many different forms, including something similar to snakes or worms, as well as flying bat-like creatures. Nom Nol was also capable of infecting other living forms, but it was particularly fond of other sentient creatures. It would usually take over its host by slithering into a victim's nostrils or throat, but was capable of passing through the pores of the skin if it needed to. Now, Once inside a body, Nom Nol would digest and absorb the victim from the inside out, growing its mass to fill the entire body cavity until the skin was all that's left, and Nom Nol essentially moved around like a sentient skin and slime water balloon. Nom Nol was able to use these skin suits incredibly effectively, even to the point of being able to pilot spacecraft, but it was easy to tell if someone was infected by Nom Nol, as their dead eyes, expressionless faces, awkward gait, and distorted voices were often a dead giveaway. And Nom Nol could only keep this charade up for a short time, as the bodies would still decay, and after only a few days... Oh my gosh, I just spit all over the place. Nom Nol could also only keep this charade up for a short time, as the bodies he inhabited would still decay after only a few days, so it would need to move on and find a new host. So basically, the flood from Halo. Now despite how it might seem, Nom Nol was a singular entity rather than individuals making up a hive mind. No matter how many different forms it took at once or how far spread apart they were, Nom Nol was fully present in all of them as a singular intelligence. It wasn't so much splitting itself up to be in multiple places, it simply was everywhere all at once in a singular consciousness. Now, although Nom Nol was incredibly ancient and possibly extra-dimensional, its home planet was Mug Fallow in the Unknown Regions. Mug Fallow had been almost entirely consumed by Nom Nol, to the point that aside from a few bare rocks and fossilized trees on the surface, the planet was almost entirely covered in its gray ooze. Nom Nol's presence was so encompassing on Mugfollow that it filled every ocean, riverbed, and underground grotto. 
Nal Nal's entire existence was dedicated to consuming as many beings and worlds as it could, and it spread throughout much of the unknown regions, taking over thousands of planets and exterminating billions of lives. Many different species in the unknown regions attempted to hold back the Nal Nal in various ways, and the Chiss Empire even tried to exterminate infestations of the Grey Goo, but it was unknown if Nal Nal would or even could ever be truly destroyed. Nomnal found a sick delight in its conquest of countless worlds, and found pleasure in causing as much pain and suffering as it could. It would often torment its victims, such as repeatedly visiting the mother of a reanimated child, or begging a spaceship crew to open the airlock for their reanimated comrades. Because of its age and spread, Nomnal had a nearly encyclopedic knowledge of the galaxy, including ancient languages, forgotten history, and hidden secrets of the universe, as well as the current happenings of the time. And while Nomnal certainly wasn't something that could be trusted, it was undeniably intelligent. Now, the concept of a malicious, sentient slime that only lives to grow more and more of itself is super weird, super freaky, and I am totally here for it. But if you were hoping that an evil sentient goo wasn't the only thing trying to take over the galaxy by turning everyone into undead horrors, then you're in luck, because next on the list is perhaps one of the most well-known and well-loved entries, the Blackwing Virus. Project Blackwing was the linchpin for the events that happened in one of the only true horror stories in the Star Wars universe, Death Troopers by Joe Schreiber and its prequel book, Red Harvest. And yes, that is a play on Blue Harvest, which was of course the codename for Return of the Jedi during production, but I digress. Also known as Imperial Bioweapons Project 171A, Project Blackwing was a bioweapon engineered by the Empire using ancient Sith alchemy to attack biological tissue and transform hosts into murderous undead creatures that functioned as a horde organism. So basically, space zombies. Now the Blackwing virus doesn't just affect humans, it can turn dozens of alien species including humans, Wookiees, Twi'leks, and even Rancors. There are multiple ways that the Blackwing virus can turn someone, the most obvious being a bite, but it can also be injected, ingested, or inhaled in an airborne form. The virus itself bore a certain level of sentience due to the genetic splicing of a telepathic and force-sensitive plant called the Mirakami Orchid, which was introduced to the virus during its initial creation by the ancient Sith. The virus would even sometimes communicate to newly infected victims before fully turning them, torturing them with horrific visions, imitating the presence of the Force, or giving false promises to maintain the victim's individuality in exchange for willing servitude. The virus worked using a concept called quorum sensing, in which viral particles would enter the host body and rapidly begin to spread and replicate while still remaining dormant and benign. The viral particles were able to sense each other's presence and tell when they had grown enough to the point where the host's immune system wouldn't be able to fight back. It would then strike all at once, turning the victim in only a few hours at most. The virus was also able to use this quorum sensing on a macro scale, lying dormant within dozens or even hundreds of corpses until there were enough infected bodies to reanimate all at once and overrun anyone still alive. The virus could communicate with other instances of itself across different host bodies with a call and response method using rhythmic screams. This allowed hordes of the undead to coordinate attacks and work as a single unit. The psychic properties of the Mirakami Orchid also allowed the virus to read the memories of its hosts and learn their skills, enabling the zombies to still use tools, fire blasters, and even pilot spacecraft. Once the virus had activated inside a host body, it would then congeal their body fluids into a thick black substance that could move independently through the victim's body, expose itself to the atmosphere and emit airborne particulates, or even transmit itself to an uninfected body and seep its way in through wounds or orifices to take over. Now, if you're thinking that a semi-sentient zombie virus that psychologically tortures its victims and can manifest as a slimy black substance capable of moving around on its own sounds kind of like the Nal Nal, well, that's no coincidence because it's been speculated for years and possibly even hinted that the virus indeed originated from Nal Nal itself. The earliest form of the Blackwing virus, simply known as the Sickness, came from a failed experiment by the ancient Sith Lord Darth Drear in 4645 BBY. Darth Drear sought a way to gain immortality, eventually leading him to create the Sickness with Sith alchemy, which he ended up succumbing to himself and dying from. 
Over a thousand years later, Darth Scabarus uncovered the holocron containing Darth Dreer's research and brought it to the Odyssey Faustin Sith Academy, where he recreated the sickness and accidentally unleashed it again, resulting in an outbreak that turned everyone at the Academy into zombies. Information about the sickness eventually passed down to Darth Vader thousands of years later, and he created a special Imperial research project to recreate and perfect the sickness, codenaming it Project Blackwing. The Imperial Star Destroyer Vector was refitted to be the headquarters for Project Blackwing, but things quickly went downhill on board, and the ship was almost entirely overrun by the undead. The Vector drifted through open space for some time after, occasionally crossing paths with other ships, at which time the undead would capture them with the Vector's tractor beam and turn anyone on board into more zombies. The Vector eventually came across the Imperial prison barge, the Purge, which was adrift after a catastrophic engine failure. Since the virus had permeated the entirety of the Vector, it quickly passed into the Purge through a scouting party, and the prison barge was quickly overtaken, turning both prisoners and Imperial personnel into the undead. The Purge's onboard doctor, Zahara Cody, discovered that she was immune to the virus and was able to create a vaccine, but by the time she was able to synthesize and distribute it, less than a dozen people were still alive. The few survivors of the Purge, which included Han Solo and Chewbacca, fought to escape the Horde, eventually having to abandon the Purge and fight their way through the Vector itself to find a spacecraft that they could escape in. Along the way, they learned that the Vector housed dozens of containers of the black oily substance that contained the virus, and that the Blackwing zombies had been making more of it to spread the infection across the galaxy using the captured spacecraft they had been collecting in the Vector's hangar bay. By the time the survivors were able to escape the Vector, only Han, Chewie, Dr. Zahara, and a young boy named Trig Longo were the only ones left alive. And as they fled the Doom Star Destroyer, they watched as dozens of other spacecraft exited the hangar bay with them. But almost as soon as they took to space, the ships began to spin out of control and crash, because fortunately, the Blackwing virus had one glaring flaw. If the zombies spent a prolonged amount of time away from an environment that allows constant exposure to the virus, they begin to lose their faculties and their body completely shuts down again, and they die for good. After the failure of Imperial Bioweapons Project 171A on board the Vector, Vader relocated the project to a secret facility on Dathomir, where again an accidental outbreak occurred and the entire facility was overrun, spreading across the planet, and even infecting the Dathomir witches of the Howling Crag clan. Not wanting to risk fully eradicating the virus, Vader opted to quarantine the infected area rather than bomb the entire planet, and eventually Dr. Zahara and Trig Longo were able to sneak into the quarantine zone with the help of Han and Chewie to distribute the antivirus that Zahara had created. They were able to rescue a few survivors, however Vader also hired several freelance agents to recover an original sample of the virus so that Project Blackwing could continue. After defeating a zombified Rancor and discovering a new type of lightsaber crystal derived from the Blackwing virus that could create a black lightsaber blade, super cool by the way, the agents recovered the necessary research and evacuated the planet. In one last effort to contain the virus, the Empire then had the Howling Crag clan massacred, but a few witches used their force sorcery, their forcery, to survive. They then learned to harness the zombie virus for their own purposes, calling themselves the Sisters of the Void and building up their own undead army. But as the virus yet again began to grow out of control, the ghost of the Howling Crag's clan mother called out to the same agents that had been hired by Vader and tasked them with killing the three sisters. What happened with Project Blackwing after that is actually a mystery, as the story abruptly ended there when the official servers for the Star Wars Galaxy's MMO were shut down in 2011. And honestly, I'm perfectly okay with not knowing how the story of the Blackwing virus ended because there's enough loose ends and any number of things could have happened afterwards, so I think it would be easy to retcon or readapt the story into the current Star Wars continuity, which would be really cool. The idea that there could still be some secret, long-lost Imperial research base with the Blackwing virus stuck inside just waiting for someone to unleash it on the galaxy once again has a lot of potential, and I still hold out that we might see some true Death Troopers once again. And no, the so-called Death Troopers from Rogue One and the voodoo zombies from Ahsoka are not a good enough replacement. They're cheap stand-ins, and I am not satisfied.
Now another Sith bioweapon gone wrong is the Rakgul Plague, which changed anyone infected by it into savage mutant cannibals that were bound to serve whoever had possession of an artifact called the Myr Talisman. This talisman was created by the Sith Lord Karnas Myr in an attempt to cheat death and build an unstoppable army loyal only to him. However, the talisman had one glaring flaw in that it could not turn any Force sensitives and only a few certain alien races. To combat this, Karnas Myr modified the Rat Ghoul transformation so that anyone turned into it by the talisman would then be capable of turning someone else into a Rat Ghoul through a scratch or a bite although the transformation did take a little bit longer than direct exposure to the talisman's powers. So basically, space werewolves, I don't know. The process of being turned into a rat ghoul was excruciatingly painful, starting with profuse bleeding from the eyes and ears, then a loss of skin pigmentation, and finally an hours long process of your body slowly twisting and morphing into the final stage of becoming a rat ghoul mutating skin, bone, and organs one by one until you were a hideous creature that looked nothing like the person you used to be. The other Sith quickly realized how dangerous and messed up Karnas Myr and his talisman were, so they decided that the best thing to do was to just kill him. The talisman eventually ended up on the planet Terrace, where it became lost in the Undercity, causing anyone turned into rat ghouls by its effects to run rampant without a master. During one of the early Mandalorian Wars, a group of Mandalorian warriors recovered the talisman and unleashed a new wave of rat ghouls on the planet Jebel. A Jedi named Celeste Morn later took possession of the lost talisman, and the planet Jebel was then covered in nuclear bombardment to wipe out any remaining rat ghouls. Knowing just how much of a threat the talisman posed to the galaxy, Celeste Morn sacrificed herself by entering an ancient Sith stasis pod hidden on the planet and she was sealed away with the talisman to make sure that it posed no threat to the galaxy. In order to further ensure that the talisman stayed hidden, any record of Celeste's existence was erased from the Jedi archives, and she was forgotten. 4,000 years later, while searching the galaxy for lost Sith artifacts, Darth Vader eventually found himself on Jebel, where he uncovered the Obliate of the Sith Lord Remulus Drapa, which was of course, the very same stasis pod containing the long-lost Celeste Morn. After being reawoken and seeing that the Sith still sought to subjugate the galaxy after so much time, Celeste battled Vader and was eventually forced to harness the talisman's powers to defeat him. She turned all of the stormtroopers that came with Vader into rat ghouls, which chased him off the planet, allowing Celeste Morn to stay hidden and alone yet again. Twenty years after that, Vader decided to see if Celeste was still alive and sent a scouting party back to Jebel to find her. They of course did, and all either died or turned into rat ghouls, so Vader set up a trap for the rebellion by leaking her location to a spy under the guise that it was the location of a secret Imperial weapon, and when the rebels got there, they were quickly attacked by the rat ghouls. Everyone escaped on the Millennium Falcon except for Luke and Leia, who were taken prisoner by the rat ghouls and brought to Celeste Morn. The spirit of Karnas Moor, which had actually existed within the amulet this whole time, sensed Luke and Leia's unique power in the Force and sought to replace Celeste with one of them. Knowing that the power was too dangerous and too corrupting, Celeste helped them escape before commandeering her own spacecraft to attack an Imperial Star Destroyer, turn everyone on board into Rat Ghouls, and then flee into the Deep Core, feeling that it was the only place that she could keep the talisman hidden and keep the powers of Karnas Myr's essence away from the galaxy. That was until 127 years later that Luke's grandson Cade found Celeste again, and the two teamed up to defeat Darth Krait. The battle ensued and the Sith Lord and his forces were defeated, but Celeste now feared a new threat, that Karnas Myr's influence would soon become too much for her to resist, and that she would eventually be compelled to use the talisman to overtake the galaxy for herself. Celeste begged Cade to rid her of Myr's influence, after which he cut her down with his lightsaber. The spirit of Karnas Myr then tried to bind the talisman to Cade, but he instead used the force to destroy the talisman for good. But this did not entirely rid the galaxy of the Rat Ghouls themselves, however, as any left went feral with no master and could still infect others, but the destruction of the Talisman meant that exterminating the Rat Ghoul Plague was at least a little bit easier now. But there's more than just evil goo and a few failed Sith experiments that have posed a threat to the galaxy. 
as you've hopefully come to realize, there are a lot of different things out in the stars that want to kill, eat, and conquer everyone around them, so much so that even the plants were getting in on it. The Drengir are one of the newest entities to the Star Wars universe, having only first appeared in the 2020 short story A Bitter Harvest, and they have since been integrated into several different story arcs ranging from the Age of the High Republic to the final days of the First Order. If you're familiar with the musical Little Shop of Horrors, then you'd have an idea of what the Drengear were. I'm just a mean green mother from outer space and I'm they were massive, intelligent, carnivorous, plant-like creatures with toothy, gaping mouths, vine-like tentacles, and poisonous thorns. So basically, space piranha plants. Like many other plants, the Drengear grew from seeds that could sprout and grow to full size in only a few days. Their goal, unsurprisingly, was to spread across the galaxy, harvesting as many worlds as they could, and all other non-botanical lifeforms to them were simply just meat to be consumed. The Drengear had deep ties to the dark side and thrived on causing chaos and imbalance in the Force. All Drengear shared a sort of hive mind, and they were capable of corrupting other individuals, including Jedi, to join in their collective consciousness. They were incredibly resistant to attacks from blasters and sabers, and could even split into two new instances of themselves if cut in half. But other types of damage like fire or the vacuum of space were still effective in killing them. The dread that they instilled on their enemies and victims was not simply because they looked scary, but they also cast a sort of force shadow that filled anyone nearby with a sense of dread and despair and could even cause other nearby plants to wither away. This force blight was one of the main ways that the Drengear would infest a community. They would lurk in the shadows or hide out in underground burrows, gradually casting their aura of death and rot on crops and other vegetation, while abducting unsuspecting victims, usually children, to take back to their lair and slowly drain of their vitality. When the time was right, the Drengear would strike whatever village or settlement they had targeted, swiftly killing all the inhabitants and leaving the area in ruins. The earliest known encounter with the Drengear was in 2500 BBY, when a group of warriors known as the Amoxene journeyed to the Drengear home planet of Malata while searching for planets to conquer. In order to better combat the Drengear, a massive relay station was built around the planet, but the Drengear were eventually able to overtake the station for themselves. A short time later, the ancient Sith discovered the station and formed a shaky alliance with the Great Progenitor, which was the first of the Drengear and the core of the Drengear hive mind. The deal quickly went sour, and the Sith imprisoned the Great Progenitor within the Amakine station and built four binding statues to serve as force dampeners that would place the Great Progenitor in a stasis, therefore causing all Drengear across the galaxy to go dormant. The Amoxine Relay would then be left abandoned for centuries, with all manner of vegetation thriving within the station, turning it into an artificial jungle inside. In the days of the High Republic, a group of Jedi would find themselves stranded on the abandoned station after the Great Hyperspace Disaster. When they discovered the Sith Binding statues, they incorrectly assumed that they were the source of the disturbing shadow of the dark side permeating the station. When the statues were taken back to the Jedi Temple, it inadvertently awoke the Great Progenitor, causing all Drengear to be revived once more and begin wreaking havoc across the galaxy. The Drengear proved to be a significant threat to the High Republic, and the Jedi battled them across dozens of planets, eventually even forming an alliance with the Hutt Clan to attack the Drengear on their homeworld of Malata. The Great Progenitor was subdued once again and placed back into a stasis, and this time, hopefully for good. Centuries later, the Amoxine Station would be a point of interest that drew the attention of both the Galactic Empire and the Crimson Dawn Syndicate due to the latent dark side energy left by the Drengear. The Crimson Dawn planned to absorb the dark side energy into a dark side artifact called the Fermata Cage, which would then be used to trap Sidious and Vader in a space-time bubble. We'll get to that in a second. Their plan obviously failed, and the Fermata Cage was destroyed, and the station was once again left abandoned. However, a few years later, Sidious would send his strand cast replicant Snoke back to the Amoxine Station to use it as a secret refuge, where he would later train Ben Solo in the ways of the dark side and turn him into Kylo Ren. 
So the concept of giant sentient plants that eat people is inherently goofy at first, but I think the Drenkir were executed in a way that made them unique and interesting enough to where they were a good formidable enemy for the Jedi to face, and honestly I really like the idea. Since they're a relatively new addition to the Star Wars canon, it's safe to assume that we haven't seen the last of the Drengir yet, and I'm interested to see what happens with them next. With such an expansive universe as that of Star Wars, there's obviously going to be quite a lot of storylines that intersect, and that can definitely be said for everything that happened with the Fermata Cage that I mentioned just a second ago. It was an ancient Sith artifact created by Darth Momin that resembled an hourglass filled with miniature black holes suspended by a dark side matrix. The Fermata Cage was able to warp time and space itself, allowing its user to freeze individual people, places, or things in time, and they could later be released with a blast of concentrated dark side energy and return them to the present as if no time had passed. And this is why Crimson Dawn brought it to the Amoxine Station, so that they could use the residual dark side energy left by the Drengear to power it. Around the same time that Darth Momin created the Fermata Cage, the Sith also created a unique droid intelligence intended to be used as a weapon. Its unusual and unpredictable nature scared the Sith, so they eventually decided to lock it within the Fermata Cage and seal it away in a dark side hellscape hidden somewhere out in the galaxy. Eventually, Lady Kira of the Crimson Dawn learned of the Fermata Cage and hired the original Knights of Ren to go retrieve it for her. Both the Fermata Cage and the Rogue Droid Intelligence were created by the Sith as just some of the many ideas to combat a dark side tech cult called the Ascendant. They were in some ways even more corrupted by the dark side, as some of their creations were considered too dark and terrible even for the Sith. One such creation was an artificial intelligence of their own called the Spark Eternal. It was created by the Ascendant to be their own weapon against the Sith, but it was never able to be utilized by the Ascendant before their staggering defeat at the hands of the Sith, after which the leader of the Ascendant hid the Spark Eternal away on the planet Barleth. The Spark was later recovered by Dr. Aphra around 4 ABY, who died in a battle with the Crimson Dawn for its possession, after which the Spark revived her body and used Aphra as its host. It would then attempt to aid Lady Kira and the Crimson Dawn in their mutual goal of destroying the Sith, leading to the battle at the Amoxine Station. During the skirmish, the Spark Eternal was separated from Dr. Aphra by Darth Vader, while Crimson Dawn was able to open the Fermata Cage. However, the Knights of Ren intervened on the side of the Sith, fearing that if the Emperor was able to escape Crimson Dawn's plot, that they would feel his wrath for helping them. The Knights of Ren were actually the ones who ended up destroying the Fermata Cage, which inadvertently released the rogue droid intelligence that had been trapped inside. The Spark Eternal, suddenly sensing a new vessel to inhabit, merged itself with the rogue droid intelligence, morphing into a hyper-intelligent artificial entity that came to be called Scourge. So basically, Space Ultron. Scourge was filled with an incredible hunger for information and began infecting other droids to read their memory banks, absorb their knowledge, and turn them into more iterations of himself. But as he expanded his consciousness across more and more units, he started to feel his reach weakening, and he eventually had to focus himself down into smaller concentrations to be effective. To combat this shortcoming, Scourge created four lesser consciousness within himself called the Warrior, the Scholar, the Child, and the Elder to help him more effectively manage himself. This allowed him to grow even more powerful, and Scourge was eventually able to possess organic life forms like cyborgs, and later, fully organic beings, including even Luke Skywalker for a time. Thankfully though, Scourge was stopped soon after, as a force-sensitive rogue AI bent on turning everyone and everything into versions of itself would be absolutely terrifying. The danger that Scourge posed to the galaxy caught the attention of another sentient droid named Ajax Sigma. Ajax had once been a warrior droid himself who fought against and was defeated by the Jedi during the High Republic era, but he had recently been reconstructed and now headed up a church for droids called the Second Revelation that fought for the individual rights of droids. So basically, Robo Space MLK. I can't say that. So basically, Space Robot Priest from Futurama. Enraged at the idea of a droid subjugating its own kind and stripping away their individuality, Ajax Sigma led his church in war against Scourge and was victorious after destroying Scourge Prime. 
Sigma recovered the Spark Eternal and reconstructed it into a new droid entity, giving it a new body and a new chance at life. That's sweet. Next up is a creature that would fit right in with H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, the Summa Verminoth. Sometimes regarded as one of the galaxy's greatest predators, the Summa Verminoth was a colossal creature that lived in the Akadisi maelstrom around the planet Kessel, preying on any ships or space creatures unfortunate enough to pass by. Their body sported numerous eyes, a large gaping mouth, and massive tentacles that measured over four miles long. These tentacles were covered in large suckers and could generate electricity, which the Summa Verminoth used to capture prey. So basically, Space Lightning Octopus. I'm running out of tea. The only time a Summa Verminoth has appeared in Star Wars was during the scene of the Kessel Run in the Solo film, where we see the crew of the Millennium Falcon disturb it and cause it to give chase. They're able to distract it by ejecting the Falcon's escape pod, which diverts the creature's attention and lures it away into the gravity well of a black hole called the Maw. And for those of you that know, yes, it's that Maw. And for those of you who don't know what I mean, just hang tight. There is also a subspecies of Summa Verminoth that appeared in the Darth Vader comic series by Greg Pak, but it bore a slightly different appearance with only one singular large eye and a more vertically oriented mouth. Uh, this creature was encountered by Darth Vader during his search for Exegol while passing through the Red Honeycomb Zone of the galactic barrier between the greater galaxy and the unknown regions. It's explained that this type of Summa Verminoth has some sort of psychic ability that it uses to hunt prey, which includes other Summa Verminoth. Vader stood his ground against this beast, eventually being able to tame it with the Force, and he took it with him to Exegol, where the Emperor then took control of it and compelled the creature to crush itself to death. Unfortunately, there's not really a whole lot of lore on the Summa Verminoth, since it's really only been seen or referenced in relation to the Kessel Run sequence in Solo, or the part from the Vader comics, but at the same time, a massive space octopus that lives inside tornadoes is a cool enough idea on its own. And with all the crazy drawn out lore behind so many different creatures and monsters and force beings in the Star Wars universe, the simplicity of just a big space squid is good enough for me. Now before we get back to said creatures and force beings with crazy drawn out lore, I want to look at one more group of monsters I only just learned about while researching for this video, and that is the Force Eaters, simply known as the Nameless. These creatures ranged in size but were usually a bit bigger than an average humanoid. Their vaguely feline bodies had pale blue skin, red eyes, clawed forelegs, and hoofed hind feet. They also had a mass of tendrils around their mouth, which were used to latch onto prey, but their true form was sometimes hard to determine, as they also possessed a telepathic ability that let them manifest in many different ways to their victims. So basically, psychic space chupacabras. The Nameless were also referred to as the Shriekarai, which was a phrase in an ancient language that just meant Eaters of the Force, and as that name would imply, the Nameless fed on the Force energy of other beings, similar to the Anzadi. However, the Nameless were far less intelligent, bearing very little sentience, and acting more on animalistic instinct more than anything else. Their preferred prey was obviously Force-sensitive beings, and they were a recurring threat to the Jedi during the High Republic era. The Nameless could sometimes kill a person simply by just being nearby, and the closer you got to one, the more you would start to have horrifying hallucinations or be filled with a sense of dread and despair. You'd experience a weakened connection to the Force, and as I just said, their presence could cause your body to petrify into a lifeless, calcified husk. Obviously, it was rather difficult for Jedi to fight the Nameless, which was something that certain enemies of the Jedi utilized to their advantage, those being a cult called the Path of the Open Hand and the Nile, who are the sort of main enemy faction in most of the High Republic stories. The Path of the Open Hand first used the Nameless against the Jedi with the help of an artifact called the Rod of Power that let them control the creatures. The Path of the Open Hand saw the Nameless as a sort of gift from the Force to help them create balance by weakening the influence of the Jedi. They eventually hatched a special Nameless referred to as the Great Leveler, which they released on Jeddah to cause havoc in the Holy City there. It was later frozen and hidden away by the cult in a shrine on the planet Ristan. Sometime later, Markion Ro, the leader of the Nile, would acquire the Rod of Power and use it to reawaken the Great Leveler. 
After proving its effectiveness in striking out against the Jedi, Rose set out to find the home planet of the Nameless in order to grow an army of Force Eaters under his control. As with the Drengear, the Nameless are still a pretty new addition to Star Wars lore, and their story is still actively being told at the time of this video. They've so far only appeared during the High Republic era and have only been referenced in stories that take place later on in the timeline, but I'd really love to see more of the Nameless, because while they're not much of a primary threat and are mainly just used as tools by stronger and more organized enemies, they're still perfectly dangerous and intimidating, and like I said, as much as I like big, ethereal, cosmic threats in the Star Wars universe, I'm also a fan of just a good, simple, scary monster. But for every good, simple, scary monster, there's also some really weird and goofy creatures too, and that can certainly be said for the next entry on our list, Waru. Appearing as a gelatinous mass contained in a shell of large golden scales that leaked a golden syrupy substance, Waru was an extra-dimensional being that first appeared in a single story arc in the 1997 book The Crystal Star, which is widely considered to be one of the worst Star Wars books ever written. His origins would later be expanded on in a series of articles for the Star Wars Gamer magazine called Supernatural Encounters, but it would ultimately go unpublished. Certain elements of these lost articles would later be integrated into a novella by Joseph Bongiorno, but that too was never officially published by Lucasfilm, and Bongiorno later released it on his personal website, meaning that while it's considered a non-canon, even in Legends, it's really all we have to look at, so we gotta use what we have. At the dawn of the galaxy's creation, the Celestials created beings known as architects to help them craft the universe. Three of these architects later became known as the Bedlam Spirits, and they sought to become all-powerful gods on their own. They created a pocket dimension they named Ilothorian to build an army of powerful creatures in secret, and one of these creatures was Waru. After a massive cosmic war between the Celestials and the Fallen Architects, they were eventually defeated and banished to Ilothorian, or what came to be called Other Space. All gateways were then sealed off and forgotten. In the Age of the Galactic Empire, Waru was pulled from other space by the experiments of one of Darth Vader's former secret apprentices, Hethrir. And no, he's not nearly as cool as THE secret apprentice, Starkiller. R.I.P. my boy. Hethrir had been seeking ways to better harness the power of the Force, and somehow his research in conjugation with the quantum effects caused by the death of a star near the planet Crisea, Waru was somehow summoned back into reality. Waru formed an agreement where he would teach Hethrir how to be stronger in the Force if Hethrir would bring him Force-sensitive beings to consume and thereby gain enough power to return home. When the Galactic Empire fell at the death of the Emperor, Hethrir wanted to secure a position of power to start his own new empire, so together he and Waru set up shop in a space station orbiting Crisea, where they started a supernatural healing cult. So basically, Space Benny Hinn. <laughs> Now here's where it gets kind of weird, if it wasn't weird already. You see, Waru could allow people to enter into himself and cure them of all sorts of ailments and maladies. He and Hethrir used this to both their advantage by drawing in people to boost the numbers of Hethrir's followers, as well as bringing in Force-sensitive folks for Waru to consume. Remember, not all Force-sensitive people were strong enough to actually use Force powers, and many never even realized they were Force-sensitive at all. Once people came to Waru for healing, he would create an opening in his scales and let people walk into his gelatinous core, where they would either absorb his unique healing properties or be consumed by him, depending on their power and the Force. Eventually, Hethrir abducted the three Solo children and planned to sacrifice them to Waru, starting with Anakin Solo. Luke, Han, and Leia obviously came to the rescue, and in the ensuing fight, Luke was engulfed by Waru while trying to save Anakin, but Han helped him get free. Waru then realized that fighting the Solos and Skywalkers simply wasn't worth the trouble, so he instead decided to just consume Hethrir, after which Waru imploded into a black hole and disappeared, presumably returning back to his home dimension. There's certainly been no shortage of weird cults in the Star Wars universe, but one that worships a sentient armored jello from another dimension is definitely unique, if nothing else. Star Wars content in the 80s and 90s was full of these kinds of wacky stories and weird characters, so there are plenty more out there if you like that sort of thing. Now let's get back to something that is held in much higher regard by the wider Star Wars community, and one that was promoted from Legends back into the official canon only two years ago in Andor. 
That is, of course, the Rakatan Infinite Empire. The Rakata were a war-loving alien race that had already mastered the use of the Force long before the ancient Sith and Jedi. They were also one of the first civilizations to develop interstellar travel using Force-powered hyperdrives, which they used to great effect in their galactic invasions, since the Rakatan's entire culture was built around conquest and war. The Rakatan Empire made heavy use of slave labor, and at one point, they had over three trillion slaves spread throughout the stars. This is actually one of the primary ways that so many different races appear on so many different worlds across the galaxy, and the Rakatan Conquest was also responsible for drastically changing the environments of numerous planets, including Tatooine, being turned from a lush world into the planet-wide desert we know it as, and they also tampered with the ecosystem of Kashyyyk, making the trees there grow so massive that it hindered the advancement of Wookiee culture and technology and kept them from becoming a more formidable enemy. This is why so much of Wookiee technology and architecture is wood-based. So basically, space Mongols. I'm sorry, we're running out of ideas, but we're almost done. The legacy of the Rakatan Empire began when the Kwa people came to their homeworld while traversing the galaxy to help developing worlds. The Kwa were servants of the Celestials and had been visiting different planets, teaching the ways of the Force to the various races that they encountered. As soon as the Rakatans learned to harness the Force, they saw it as a tool to aid in their conquest, and they devoted themselves to the dark side as a means to take over the galaxy. The Rakatans used their newfound abilities to create all sorts of Force-powered weapons, including Force Sabers, which would eventually be adapted and modified into the more traditional lightsabers of the Sith and Jedi. The Rakatans quickly began to spread their infinite empire across the galaxy, often imprisoning slaves on their warships to use as a source of force energy to power their technology. Occasionally, a slave would show adeptness in the force and would then be trained and conditioned into hounds to serve the Rakatan war effort. Naturally, the Rakatan expansion contradicted the peaceful ways of the Kwa, and while the Kwa did stand against the infinite empire for a time, they were eventually defeated and subjugated themselves. In one final effort to hold off the Rakatans from a larger galaxy, the Kwa destroyed the infinity gates that they had used for intergalactic travel, but this did not stop the Rakatans. They would go on to build the Star Forge, an automated space station powered by the dark side that drew matter and energy from stars to build an endless supply of ships, weapons, and other war materials. The Rakatan Conquest encountered many formidable enemies, including the Eshka, the Sith race of Korriban, and the ancient Jedi Order, and while they all stood their ground for a time, the Infinite Empire continued to expand across the galaxy. The Sith, however, were eventually able to defeat and drive the Rakatans away, and it was this victory that later emboldened the Sith to try galactic conquest for themselves, eventually leading to the cycle of war between the Jedi and Sith that lasted for millennia. As the Infinite Empire continued to grow, the Rakatans started to realize that the more they conquered, the weaker they were starting to become. Their dark side technology was starting to leech power off of the Rakatans themselves as well as their slaves, making them weaker, more volatile, and less formidable of a military power. They started to resort to more and more infighting, allowing slaves to rise up and rebel. A mysterious plague would later spread to most Rakatan soldiers, weakening their connection to the Force and as their hold on the galaxy continued to weaken, the Infinite Empire began to retract further and further, eventually falling apart entirely and forcing the Rakatans to return to their home planet, a shadow of the powerful people that they had once been. Many of their war machines were destroyed, forgotten, or abandoned, but the Star Forge would later be rediscovered by Darth Revan, who used it to grow his own Sith Empire. Now, an ancient dark side adept race of hammerhead aliens is cool and all, I hear you say, but what if there was an even more murderous and barbaric group of aliens that didn't need the Force to take over the galaxy? Well, you're in luck, I reply, because our next entry just so happens to be the sadomasochistic barbarian race that was entirely rejected by the Force, and their invasion ended up claiming over three trillion lives. That is, of course, the Yuuzhan Vong. The Yuuzhan Vong were a barbaric alien race so brutal and violent that they were entirely cut off by the Force, meaning that not only could none of the Yuuzhan Vong use the Force, but many Force abilities had little to no effect on them. They had roughly humanoid bodies, pale gray or yellow skin, large sloped foreheads, and occasionally were seen with pointed ears. They also had short stubby noses that gave them a very skull-like appearance, which is something I'm sure helped them instill fear on their enemies. 
While they grew thick black hair, many often went bald, and small blue sack-like growths under their eyes reflected an individual's mood. Most Vong were covered in piercings, scars, and tattoos, and their unique nervous system was especially sensitive to pain, which to them was a good thing, as I'll explain in a second. Due to a massive droid war that destroyed much of their home galaxy, the Yuuzhan Vong were also deeply opposed to any sort of advanced technology or mechanical tools. Hold on, my wife's calling me. Due to a massive droid war that destroyed much of their home galaxy, the Yuuzhan Vong were also deeply opposed to any sort of advanced technology or mechanized tools and equipment and everything from their clothes and weapons to their own starships were constructed entirely from genetically engineered biomatter. They were obsessed with the concept of pain to the point that they almost worshipped the idea of pain itself, viewing it as a superior state of being. Many Yuuzhan Vong would partake in all sorts of self-harm as a way to be closer to their gods, who they believed mutilated their own bodies to create the universe. As Yuuzhan Vong warriors grew more and more experienced in battle, it was common for them to augment their own bodies through organ grafting in a ritual known as the Eschatalier Ceremony. By swapping out their own body parts and organs for new ones, they believed this made them more stronger and more formidable in battle, and the individual partaking in the Eschatalier Ceremony was often promoted to a higher rank afterwards. Much of Vong culture was based entirely around the family unit, but their society was also largely centered on a caste system with strict social protocols. So basically, space Aztecs. And that one's not a joke. The Yuuzhan Vong were actually heavily inspired by ancient Mesoamerican culture, so I do my research. At the time of their invasion of the Galactic Republic, Vong society was ruled by a single supreme overlord, while the rest of their society was broken down into different castes. There were the Shapers, who constructed all the various Biots, the priests, who oversaw the various rituals and worship ceremonies of the gods, and the warriors, who did most of the fighting. And then there was the Intendants, who helped manage the economy, and finally the Workers, who were tasked with the menial jobs, mundane work, and slave labor. The workers were largely made up of enslaved and conquered races, but some disgraced Vong could also find themselves put down into that caste. The gods of the Yuuzhan Vong were similarly allocated to specific aspects of life and represented certain elements of Vong culture. There was Yun Yuuzhan, the creator, Yun Harla, the trickster, Yun Yamka, the slayer, Yun Nichelle, the modeler, Yun Twin and Yun Ka, the twin lovers, and Yun Shumo, the pardoner, who was the only god that shamed ones were allowed to worship. Now, despite being rather brutal and barbaric, the Yuuzhan Vong also held a very strict code of honor and almost always kept their word. They also deeply valued the concept of revenge to the point that even calling someone a rude name meant that they were completely within their rights to murder you on the spot. As you might be able to deduce so far, the Yuuzhan Vong were really obsessed with death because in a roundabout way, they actually deeply valued life. They viewed life and death in a way not too unlike the concept of the circle of life in The Lion King. Life ends in death, which makes way for new life, leading to more death, and so on. And this is why they were so deeply opposed to machinery, because machinery cannot die and make way for new growth. It just takes up space and takes life, and therefore it is a waste of space and should be destroyed. This is why all Yuuzhan Vong technology was entirely biological, be it their clothes, their weapons, their everyday items, and even their spacecraft. Since the word technology had connotations to advanced machinery, the Yuuzhan Vong instead used the word biot to refer to any of the specially bioengineered materials, devices, or creatures they made use of. But the Yuuzhan Vong weren't always that way. They were once a relatively normal race of people who came from the living planet Yuuzhan Tar, and at one time, they could actually use the Force. But a terrible war between two droid civilizations destroyed much of the Vong's home galaxy and turned them into jaded, bitter people who came to hate other life forms and absolutely despise machines. As the Vong fought for survival, they became increasingly barbaric, eventually gaining enough power themselves to sweep across their galaxy, wiping out both droid civilizations and exterminating or enslaving pretty much everyone else. With the galaxy under their control, the Vong now turned on each other, resulting in a massive interspecies war that further destroyed the galaxy, including their own homeworld. 
It was at this point that the Force cut them off, since they had so willingly caused the annihilation of an entire galaxy and had no intention of stopping. Eventually, the Vong Civil War ended when a warlord named Yogand defeated his enemies using a special biot to pull a moon into the planet his rivals were on, destroying them and the planet entirely. This tactic came to be known as Yogan's Core and became a common practice in Vong Conquest afterwards. Yogan was then able to unite the rest of the various factions and became the first supreme overlord of the Yuzang Vong. After the destruction caused by millennia of conflict in their own galaxy, the Yuzan Vong set out across the universe to conquer a new galaxy, traveling the void of space for centuries. Around 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, the earliest Vong probes reached the main galaxy of the Star Wars universe, shortly followed by the first Vong scouts. Ancient Mandalorians were actually the first to encounter the Vong after finding a crashed probe biot, but the probe fled back into space and they were disregarded as nothing really all that important. Then about a year before the events of the Phantom Menace, Darth Maul faced a Yuuzhan Vong warrior in a gladiatorial match while undercover at the Cog Hive 7 prison, as told in the book Darth Maul Lockdown. But since no one had any way of identifying the Vong or understanding its language, there was no way to know anything about it, so nothing really came of it. But around the same time, a few other Vong scouts were landing in the unknown regions on Zenoma Sakat, which was another living planet grown from a seed of the Yuuzhan Vong's own home planet, Yuuzhan-Tar, although they didn't know that at this point. The planet fought back against the Vong's arrival, eventually making the supreme leader of the Vong at the time doubt their plans of invasion, and then he was quickly murdered for his cowardice and replaced with a new leader. Around 27 BBY, Palpatine first learned of the Vong's existence, but he decided to keep it a secret until the information proved to be more politically beneficial. It was also around this time that the Vong had their first battles with the Chiss, and they also started abducting various races to study and experiment on. The official invasion hadn't begun quite yet, but the Vong began establishing outposts in the unknown regions in preparation for the rest of their forces to arrive over time. The Vong kept their distance from the wider galaxy over the next few decades, slowly gaining power over much of the unknown regions, and by 25 ABY, they started to move in on the planets in the Outer Rim. One of these planets was Mandalore, whose survival was bargained for by Boba Fett in exchange for helping the Vong with their invasion on the rest of the Galactic Republic. Fett saw this as the only option to save his people, but he later fed information in secret back to the Republic leaders to warn them that the Vong would soon strike. The Vong invasion began with the release of a deadly bioweapon, followed by the first wave of Vong soldiers, who used the Yogan's core tactic to destroy several planets, including an attack that killed Chewbacca. When they first encountered the Jedi Order, the Vong labeled them as infidels and made them their top target, since they fought with the power of the Force that they themselves had once been denied. As the Vong moved more and more into the main part of the galaxy, the New Republic decided to take action. But when the Vong offered a ceasefire in exchange for every Jedi being turned over, the desperate leaders of the Republic issued arrest warrants for Luke, Mara Jade, and many other Jedi. The Vong later attacked the Jedi Temple on Yavin 4, but the attack was ultimately thwarted with the help of one of the Disgraced Ones, turning many other Disgraced Ones to the Jedi's side. While the Vong were still a massive threat, the New Republic started to gain more and more victories, weakening the Vong and causing doubt and infighting among the invaders. Eventually, Luke Skywalker led a team into the Unknown Regions in search of the living planet Zonoma Sakat, and he was able to convince the planet to help them defeat the Yuuzhan Vong. Zenoma Sakat then relocated itself through hyperspace to the same star system as Coruscant, where the Republic planned to make one final push to drive out the invaders. In the ensuing battles, Luke Skywalker defeated the Supreme Overlord Shimra, but it was later revealed that the entire invasion had been secretly orchestrated by a single Force-sensitive Yuuzhan Vong named Onimi, who was then killed by Jason Solo, Han and Leia's other son. With both Vong leaders defeated, the role went to the highest ranking War Master, who decided that it was finally time to surrender and bring an end to the war. The remaining Vong were given the choice to integrate and help rebuild the galaxy, or go into exile with Sonoma Sakat back to the Unknown Regions. Any Vong who refused those options was executed. While the Vong still retained many of their beliefs and ritual practices, they came to realize that in order for them to survive as a people, they needed to change and adapt from some of their old ways. 
The Yuuzhan Vong would go on to play a part in several different events afterwards, but their plans of galactic domination were behind them, and those who remained in the galaxy became much more of an ally to the Jedi from then on. The story arc of the Yuuzhan Vong War is one of the most beloved of the old canon, and it's been speculated for years that Disney might still somehow bring the Vong back into the timeline. But many are skeptical that Disney would be able to do the story justice, but until then, we always have the old stories to look back fondly on. Now finally we've come to the one I'm sure many of you were waiting for me to talk about, and that is the destructor and bringer of chaos, Abeloth. The being that would become Abeloth began as a normal, mortal woman brought into the servitude of the Mortis Gods, or the Ones, over a hundred thousand years before the Battle of Yavin. She became a sort of mother to the two children, and she would often be the one to quell disputes and keep the peace between them. As time went on, Abeloth aged more and more while the Mortis beings remained eternal, and so, in order to stay with her family forever, Abeloth drank from the Font of Power and bathed in the Pool of Knowledge, which were two Force Nexus points that had transformed the son and daughter into the physical manifestations of the Dark Side and the Light Side. Abeloth had been strictly prohibited by the Father from exposing herself to the Font of Power and the Pool of Knowledge, but she saw it as the only way to ensure that she could be with her family forever. And while her act did grant her the immortality she sought, it also turned her into a corrupt and twisted version of herself. She was transformed into a hideous creature with sunken black eyes and a mouth stretching from ear to ear full of sharp pointed teeth. And in the place of arms, Abeloth now had multiple suction cupped tentacles protruding from each shoulder. Her love and desire to care for her family was also corrupted into a craving for companionship and an obsession with binding others to her will so that she could always be loved and adored. So basically, Space Lilith. Abeloth was quickly driven to madness and gained some of the most powerful and terrifying abilities in the Force, including possession, mind control, teleportation, and the ability to exist beyond physical reality and bind herself to the flow of time itself. After discovering her crime, the father banished Abeloth to the Maw, which was a point in space filled with a cluster of artificial black holes that would serve as a sort of prison to contain her. The Ones then enlisted the help of a hive mind species called the Killix to help them maintain the Maw, and they created installations called Centerpoint Station and Sinkhole Station to further monitor, maintain, and contain Abeloth, who was imprisoned there for millennia and driven insane by loneliness and despair. The most terrible thing Abeloth could comprehend was the idea of being alone with no one to love and care for, and now by her own action, that very thing had happened. Due to her unique bond with the Force, whenever major events happened in the galaxy that caused large disturbances in the Force or drastically affect the course of history, Abeloth was able to break free of her prison and had to be contained by the son and daughter, which was one of the few things that actually made them kind of get along. This went on for millennia until the Ones died on Mortis after encountering Anakin Skywalker, and now, with no one powerful enough to contain her anymore, Abeloth needed only wait for another opportunity to break free, after which she could subjugate the galaxy for good. After millennia of war between the Sith and Jedi, her chance finally came in 40 ABY when Jason Solo started having nightmarish visions of a revived Sith Empire with his daughter at the right hand of whoever would rule it and he sought a way to keep this from happening. His quest eventually led him to fall to the dark side himself, becoming the Sith Lord Darth Cadus and plunging the galaxy into a second civil war. He would eventually be defeated and killed by his twin sister Jaina Solo, but in a roundabout way, Jason had brought the galaxy to relative peace by causing so many different groups and factions to lay aside their differences and stand against him, meaning that the cycle of war between the Sith and Jedi had, at least for a time, come to an end, and the future that he feared for his daughter would never happen. This also meant that the future had been altered, leaving a rift in the universe just big enough for Abeloth to break through. She quickly went to work in trying to take over the galaxy, luring people to the Maw to consume their essence and grow her influence. Some of these people included Callista Ming, a former lover of Luke Skywalker, and several members of the Jedi Order. She then uncovered a lost Sith meditation sphere named Ship, which was a sentient piece of dark side technology that helped her locate an outcast tribe of Sith that had once served the Dark Lord Naga Sadao over 5,000 years ago. Abeloth turned the Lost Tribe to her cause, building a dark side army devoted to her service. She then possessed the body of a galactic senator named Rokari Kem and used her dark powers to influence political actions and became appointed as Chief of State, effectively making her the ruler of the entire Galactic Alliance. 
Luke Skywalker and the rest of the new Jedi Order quickly stepped in to stop Avaloth and her dark side army, but as she fled Coruscant, she took a Sith apprentice named Vastara Kai and Luke's own son Ben Skywalker with her as she fled, with the goal of forcing them to be a new son and daughter to her, and eventually lure Luke into being the new father. Now while all this was going on, there was an entirely separate group of Sith, led by the self-appointed Darth Krayt, that had been secretly growing their regime in hiding on the planet Korriban. Darth Krayt ruled under the concept of a single all-powerful Dark Lord, and it was actually Darth Krayt that Jason had seen in his visions of his daughter. Darth Krayt saw Abeloth's conquest of the galaxy as a threat to his own, so he reluctantly revealed himself to Luke Skywalker and agreed to help him defeat Abeloth. Together, they faced Abeloth's spiritual essence in a parallel force dimension called the Beyond Shadows, which was similar but not the same as the World Between Worlds. Vastara Kai and Ben Skywalker had also put aside their differences to battle Abeloth's physical form, and together the four were able to defeat Abeloth in both body and soul. Now despite the apparent victory, Luke still feared that Abeloth wasn't and perhaps couldn't be truly defeated, and the Jedi took on a new quest of finding the Mortis Blade which had once been used by Anakin to kill the Ones, and could perhaps put a stop for Abeloth once and for all, if or when she ever returned. The Jedi were eventually able to locate the massive obelisk that had once taken Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka to Mortis, but the realm they found inside was corrupted and imbalanced, and even worse, the Mortis Blade was nowhere to be found. This was kind of the last straw for the old heroes like Luke, Leia, and Han, who realized that their years of saving the galaxy from threat after threat had come to an end, and it was time to pass the reins off to the new generation of heroes. They had to trust that they had set a strong enough path for their descendants to watch after the galaxy long after they were gone. And like with many other open-ended storylines, the tale of Abeloth ended in 2013 with the Disney takeover and subsequent reset of the Star Wars timeline. Abeloth is another Legends entity that many Star Wars fans have been itching to be reintroduced into the Star Wars canon, and the shot of Balin's skull standing on the statue of the Father at the end of the Ahsoka series has led some to believe that she may appear pretty soon. But just how or even if she will show up is still just hearsay, so until then, we can really only speculate. I've been a big fan of Star Wars pretty much as long as I can remember, and some of my earliest memories are actually from my brother whacking me in the fingers while we played with toy lightsabers. It's been really cool to see just how many stories have been told within the Star Wars universe over the years, and regardless of if you love the old Legends tales or the new canon, I personally think that there are still plenty of interesting and entertaining things to keep myself and plenty of other fans coming back time after time. And hopefully, I too can keep things interesting and entertaining enough to keep you coming back time after time. I'd love to know which one of the things I talked about today was your favorite, or if there was something I missed, or if there's something else you'd like me to talk about, whether it's Star Wars related or otherwise. I'm always open to suggestions, and I'd love to know what kind of content I can make to keep you all entertained. With that said, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you sticking around, and I'll see you here next time. Goodbye, everyone.